The WSA has the ability to authenticate users before providing them with internet access. Uh, this gives us a couple advantages. One, we can find the best policy that fits that user, so we get them into the conditions and authorization that they're used to. And of course, this is going to help us out from a perspective of logging. We know who's responsible for what particular actions. The WSA authentication is able to track and report users based on username instead of IP, meaning the reporting that we uh, perform is going to be much more intuitive. And the way that it does this is because it can integrate with the existing authentication infrastructure. If you've already got Active Directory, we can interact with it to retrieve information about what username exists at a particular IP address. Uh, this is used as a prerequisite for enforcing distinct policies between different users. And that is, uh, if I want to say, you know, Joe the user gets a particular policy, I want to make sure that A, that's a valid user within the organization, and maybe there's not something else that could, could potentially override that. We can even get into allowing specific user agents. And user agent, this is a field uh, that exists inside of your HTTP header. So anytime you send HTTP traffic, out there into the web, there's HTTP headers, just like we got TCP and UDP headers, uh, which are basically fields with arguments inside of them, and they help the, the server know how to respond to you, right? So if you say, hey, give me index.html, they're like, who are you? And they look at your user agent, and they go, oh, it's Safari on a mobile device. And maybe it will return slightly different content than they would if it was Firefox on a desktop device. So just things to think about. And we can use it in terms of um, content security as a way to create policies. I can say, hey, when you see these types of browsers trying to access this type of content, permit or deny. Additionally, we can restrict certain protocols if necessary. Uh, we talk a lot about HTTP, uh, but the WSA also has got the ability to inspect FTP. Uh, for now, we're really just focused on the authentication aspect of it. So the WSA supports different authentication types, server types, and schemes. Uh, the two different authentication types that we call it are active authentication and passive. And it's very descriptive of what it does. With active, we have a direct interaction where we're relaying to Active Director LDAP. The passive is pretty neat. It uses an intermediate agent, context directory agent, and it leverages ICE. <clears throat> so assuming that we've got an ICE solution we can talk to, um, what we'll basically do, this works pretty neat. You've got users, and sometimes we call supplicants, uh, that come into the organization. Now, whenever you authenticate uh, to, let's say, Active Directory, Active Directory is going to have a security log. And the security log talks about you know, who logged in and who didn't. If people have failed authentication attempts, I can see that. If people authenticate successfully, I can, of course, see that too. So let's say I've got a user here called Bob, and Bob had an IP address of 10.3.3.5. Now, this is recorded in these security logs. Here's where it starts to get more interesting. When we leverage other components, and the ASA is even smart enough to think about this, so we could leverage this in the ASA, and this can be identity-based access control list. So source and destination, instead of using an IP address, we can say this domain with this user. It looks kind of funny the first few times you do it. I, th I felt like everything had merged together. I was like, what? I can put Active Directory accounts right into a Cisco access list? And you really basically can. Um, in those scenarios, the ASA is implementing a lot of its filtering based on access list. Access list is based on IP addresses. Our conversation is about user accounts, right? So how do we get there? By leveraging this uh, context directory agent, CDA, the ASA interacts with the CDA through RADIUS. So this is an authentication protocol that's open standard. And one of the things that you'll read about it in, in the first few sentences in most scenarios is that it's highly extensible and then it has uh, the capability to support VSA as or vendor-specific attributes. And that boils down to the fact that we have AV pairs, attribute value, VLAN 10, first name, Ryan, class name, score, things like that. That's an attribute and value. We can return AV pairs very easily through RADIUS, and because it's so extensible, we could come back with just about anything that you want. You just code it in there. So the ASA and the CDA are having this communication via RADIUS, which is kind of a normal thing. Switches, routers, firewalls, they all communicate with us to retrieve attributes about user conditions. 
What CDA that does uh, does that I thought was a little bit slick is it um, uses a communication protocol called WMI, uh, Windows Management Instrumentation. And this gives you ability to basically control a remote window system and really kind of do what you want with it if you have the right credentials and you know um, how to make the request. So in our case, we're gonna, we're gonna require the, the right credentials to be able to communicate with it. But if we can, assuming that we've got those rights on this machine, I can come in and query the security logs. And basically what I'm looking for are successful authentication attempts and the attribute value pairs that I'm looking at are user accounts to IP addresses. Once I can ingest that into the CDA, I push it back out to other Cisco devices and I can say, hey, if you wanna do filtering based on Bob, Bob's at 10335. So this gives us the ability to create policies that can be dynamically resolved. If Bob goes to lunch, he comes back, he has a new IP address, Again, we can get that latest information and adjust our policy based on it. The process of integrating with that back end, uh, typically we're doing so through Active Directory and we can leverage Kerberos. Uh, we can leverage NTLAN Manager. We can leverage what's called basic authentication. And when we do direct LDAP, it only supports basic authentication. That said, we can do LDAP S uh, and then we'll just do basic authentication through it. So looking at uh, the WSA, it supports two authentication protocols, NTLM, which is great for talking to Active Directory, and LDAP. There's other people out there that just did things standard space. They may have an open LDAP installation, maybe they're using Novell or SUS, um, and that's just where they chose to put all their Active Directory, or directory components, I should say, not Active Directory. Um, <clears throat> NTLM is most common because Active Directory is so common. What does that mean? Uh, well, Kerberos will give us better performance and stronger authentication. Basic is old, it's not secure, the credentials are sent in clear text, and NTLM is gonna be challenge response based. Uh, if you capture the challenge, you capture the response, you can do some cracking of it, which is why we come back and we say Kerberos tends to be a, a bit more preferred. Um, single sign-on can be achieved with NTLM as well as Kerberos. Uh, only restriction there is, uh, of course, basic. So what they're showing happening here is really the WSA's communication with Active Directory. We're going to want to leverage LDAP or NTLM. So remember that when we implement these proxies, they can be implemented either in explicit mode or a transparent mode. Transparent mode is where we're doing some wizardry within the network to grab certain traffic flows and kind of redirect them into the WSA whether it's WCCP or policy-based routing, we're basically pushing it off. Remember with explicit mode, what happens is that the user's endpoint knows that it's supposed to use a proxy. So in this case, the user sends a web request to the proxy and the proxy is like, who are you sending me web requests? And it sends it this code 407. And basically the user is gonna have to come back and authenticate, um, potentially. What we see here is when he sends this proxy authentication request, we're gonna come back to the WSA and have to interact with it. Now there's lots of different ways that we can do this. There's um, captive portals that we can force people through. We can leverage things like 802.1x. There's lots of different approaches. But if the WSA knows who that particular user is, we have the capability to give them a distinct network profile. So we can say, these are the things that you're allowed to do within our organization. Remember, we could have leveraged ICE and 802.1x um, through wireless before they even got onto the network, before they even did DHCP. Now they did DHCP, they're trying to get out to the internet, we grabbed again and we're like, wait a minute, who goes there? We can make sure that it is actually a user at the, at the terminal, and it's not just some script running in the background, some malware that's trying to call home. Um, neat stuff that we can do. But basically, once we know who that user is, we're gonna allow their traffic to pass through the WSA, and hit the web server. Here we see transparent proxy mode. In this case, the WSA spoofs the web server and the user doesn't really know that there's a web proxy there. So that proxy uh, 407, that authentication request, can't be used. Why? Because the user wasn't configured to use a proxy. This is where the user can be authenticated by using CWA or centralized web auth. Again, we'll just steer that user into a central portal, force them to authenticate there. Again, we've got all of our good logging data. We know who they are, what they're supposed to be doing. Send that traffic out to the internet. Now, in order to authenticate the user, you've got an authentication realm. Now, do you have to have multiple authentication realms supporting different types 
of communication, like Active Directory versus LDAP, supporting different schemes, again, different servers. No, you might have all of your users in a single database, and that makes a lot of sense. But in a scenario where maybe you've done mergers or you've done um, uh, maybe a split of the organization, you had one domain and now there's multiples and you've got different policies, just realize that the WSA has the flexibility to deal with an environment that has got uh, multiple backend authentication databases. The authentication realms are just leveraged within identification profiles. So the way that this really works is we say, hey, when we see, you know, in this case, maybe AP marketing, we want to authenticate the marketing folks via this realm. If we see sales, maybe all of our sales accounts are in a different database. If that's the case, remember that in addition to having different policies for each of these different groups of users, URL filtering, anti-malware filtering, DLP, and so forth, we can also have different authentication realms or authentication backends. Whenever we use transparent user identification with Active Directory, this is where we're actually integrating uh, with that WMA process that I described earlier. And once again, this is called transparent user identification. It was one thing to do a transparent proxy. That's where I was steering traffic into the, the WSA without the user explicitly configuring a uh, proxy configuration. Uh, in their browser, or remember you can also retrieve that through DHCP. There's a DHCP option where we can push WPAD or Web Proxy Auto Discovery, and we can say, hey, your PAC file's over here, this is you know, how you get out. If we weren't interacting with the client in that way, because he may not follow our directions anyhow, we'll say, you know what, we're just steering all web traffic over the WSA. Why? Because our switch has a rule for it. Well, before the user was even able to get to that switch, there's a good chance they had to authenticate. This ties back to leveraging 802.1x in the environment. By authenticating to the domain, they're gonna have that IP address, user combination in their security logs. So what happens with the CDA is it leverages WMI to retrieve those mappings. Over here, we can push it to the WSA. The WSA now transparently, without user interaction, was able to figure out who is logged in. Once we know who it is, we can uh, apply the appropriate policy uh, to their content. So the WSA can transparently authenticate users via ICE by leveraging 802.1x. ICE and the WSA exchange those IP to user mappings through PX Grid. And then we can also leverage Cisco ICE to assign security group tags to authenticated users. So just different approaches of how we can take that user authentication information and then apply an appropriate policy to our network infrastructure based on group membership, based on even things like the security posture, being patched versus unpatched. Really, ICE is the grand gatekeeper in terms of where people are allowed to go based on things like secure policy and secure posture, having your antivirus up to date, having all your updates done. But in addition to the, th to the security controls that we leverage through ICE, realize that we can push additional controls to email with the ESA, and of course to web content with the WSA. So bypassing authentication and reauth. In some scenarios, we'll want to bypass authentication, and maybe it's because an application doesn't support it. How many different devices do we have that have to connect to some cloud controller in order to communicate? Maybe it's a thermostat, maybe it's a badge reader, maybe it's an IP camera. So of course, we can create exceptions for devices that aren't smart enough to auth. Um, additionally, from the other perspective, what happens if somebody auths and walks away? We can do things like re-authenticating users. Tracking user credentials is pretty critical, right? This is going to make all of our, our logging, all of our reporting actually mean something. So when we're trying to track and associate web requests with users, we can look at different things. Of course, we can look at the user account. We can also look at things like the user agent. We can associate authentication with the browser. And when you successfully authenticate, the application is going to push you a cookie, right? That cookie is just your session ID, which should stay the same throughout uh, that session. So by being in the middle, by being able to look at all the communication back and forth, I could say all the traffic that deals with this cookie must be the same user. 